been wanting to cut my head off for a retaliation the stuff that I'd done in Africa. So we got put in hiding, we were in hiding for three years. As a sniper, your primary role is to gather lifetime information of the battlefield. Your second primary role is to take that target out if needed. I fired my first shot, I missed, fired my second shot, I hit one guy because he stood up and I fired my third shot. The bullet took six seconds time of flight to get there. The objective was done, I got his head down. Craig, so you've got the world record for the two longest confirmed sniper kills in combat. 2,700 and 76 yards. 76 yards, all right. We've got death threats. From the shot that I'd done, because it all got leaked to the media, my name, my wife's name, my daughter's name, everything. My old wife always imagined a red doll. I think of suicide. I think of suicide every day. Every day? Every fucking day. When do you first become aware of something like PTSD? Then? My wife noticed it a couple of weeks later. I got called in. They said, you're done. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're done. He said, we've got the report back. You've got... What does nearly 3,000 yards look like? You mentioned to me earlier, like a football pitch is 112 to 115 yards. When you do your sniping, um, you break things down like because you know roughly what a football pitch is and you break it down. Right. But, um, yeah, it is a long way, you know, and um, my rifle wasn't designed to go that far. Really? Yeah, my rifle was uh, designed to go 1,500 um, yards um, with the scope capability and the ammunition and the capability to that rifle. So, uh, but... Everyone think a bullet goes in a straight line, it doesn't it? Arches. Yeah. And then then goes down and gravity takes. Okay. It does. Mm. You know, that's why the big fifty calibers, uh, the four oh eights, you know, rifles, they go a longer distance because it's a heavier rifle. Yeah. Heavier round. Yeah. So it's gonna go longer. Yeah, but um yeah, it's a long way. Like I said to you before, you know, if you go to Windsor and go by the road on the long, there's a long road there from Windsor Castle. That's a mile and a half. So if anyone listening goes there, you know, just stand by the main road bit and look up to the uh, um, the statue up there. That's a mile and a half. You can see how big the figures are and stuff like that. And what was the terrain like that you were uh, you were out in at that time? Um, very undulated ground. Um, but I was lucky that um, when I did my shot, everyone thinks I was laid down. I was stood up when I did my shot. Yeah, I okay. can. Um, let it get to the wall um, because the undulating ground, I wasn't able to make that shot in the first place. And the idea was that I wasn't going to take that shot. I just wanted to get the guy to originally that I was shooting at um, his head down. Okay. Um, and, and it took me nine shots to get there in the morning. I was. I think called bracketing. So I fired one shot, saw it, fell, and then I lifted my rifle a bit more, fired again, fired again, fired again, till I finally hit the compound wall. And um, because it makes a really thud, yeah, um, because their walls are made of mud shit and God knows what, um, a cloud of dust. And then, um, yeah, I, the objective was done. I got his head down and I never saw him again. And then later on, that, a couple of hours later, and these two guys appeared with a machine gun. So I knew roughly why I was aiming. Yeah. Um, but the idea, again, was to get their heads down to stop them firing. Um, but I fired my first shot. I missed. Fired my second shot. Um, I hit one guy because he stood up. And I fired my third shot. And uh, the bullet took six seconds time of flight to get there. you got to think fast on your feet. Um, and that six seconds is a long time, you know. As a sniper, your primary role is to gather lifetime information of the battlefield. That is your primary role. Your second primary role is to take that target out if needed. I remember speaking to this sniper um, in Iraq, and, and I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to become a sniper because, one, they get treated like adults. You know, they've got more responsibility mm -hmm. on tours, you know, and they get Gucci kit and stuff like that. So I said, this is what I want to do. And I kept saying, I want to be a sniper. And I said, no, you can't do that. And I just kept on and on and on. And eventually, the guy in charge of the Armoured Corps, which my regiment was belonged to as well as the Household Division, but the Armoured Corps itself, because we had truck vehicles, um, finally said, yeah, we, we allowed snipers into the regiment. I thought, put it in. You go on to do your sniping phase. That's the hardest bit. Being sneaky is hard. And I'm six foot four. 
walking around in a ghillie suit, I stand out. Yeah. So I have to make myself small as possible, you know. And um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, and I, and I just flourished, and I went back to the regiment as a badge sniper. You know, the first one in the regiment. Amazing. And do you think that was just your persistence that that, that got you that role in the end? You just yeah, take because I, had a, so. I didn't have a plan B to start off with. But really, I didn't know when I said I want to be a sniper. That was my plan A again. Yeah, I didn't really have a plan B. So yeah. I just kept hanging and hanging, you know. And eventually, you know, luckily enough, um, they called him Drac, you know, of the Armour Corps, and decided, yeah, we're, we're allowed snipers in the regiment, you know, because we did an armour, we do reconnaissance, mm. and being a sniper is a reconnaissance role as well, in a way, because people always think, as a sniper, you just go out and shoot people. You know, um, but it's not the case. Yeah, how long um, were you in the army? You did ten tours, am I right? Ten tours, uh, two thousand. Uh, sorry, twenty-three years. I didn't really want to leave. Yeah. You know, I was the army institutionalised you in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, and everything's on a plate with you. You know, dentistry, medical, and stuff like that. Bills. All done three, for you. Yeah, all done yeah. for you. And I didn't really want to get out. You know, um, because I didn't understand what Civil Street was really about. Really, mm-hmm. it scared me. Civil Street. Did. I was, I was petrified that I was going to get out of the army and become homeless. Were you? Yeah, because I think I don't know any life skills. Yeah. Because the army has said anything for me, you've got no life skills. My last tour, yeah, I had more responsibility. And that's where, you know, I hit an idea. I got shot in the helmet, first of all, in a big firefight. And it went round the helmet and came out top, knocked me out for about 20 seconds. Oh, wow. And knocked out cold, you know, because there's three spikes to a bullet. So they get supersonic when it comes out. And he goes transonic, and then he goes subsonic. Transonic is when it starts wobbling, yeah. and then it sorts itself out. And because it's lost so much energy, sorting itself out, he goes subsonic, and then he hits the target. Or depends on where where you are at the time. And there's certain distances where it's got those three transfers and bullet. But yeah, the AK-47 it was, and it hit me inside of the helmet. Going supersonic from the distance that he shot at. Hand. My, my wagon got hit about, I think when we counted all the bullet holes, about 136 times, because you have to um, collect all damage, battle assessment, stuff like that. Yeah. So my Jerry cans went, my water, my fuel, my spare wheel, fucking everything. It was just, because it was an open top vehicle as well. Oh, okay. So, and, is that where you got a brain injury from? Um, my, I got a concussion, but from this day on, from this day now, sorry, on, um, mm. I got no recollection of what I'd done. And apparently I stayed on top of the hill, extracted all the blokes off the hill, carried on fighting, and then um, extracted myself off the hill and then got back um, to safe safe location. And when, you know, you, you kind of accumulate those, those kind of injuries, um, when do you first become aware of something like PTSD, you know, this kind of sign? I didn't notice it. Right. Uh, my wife noticed it first. Wife did. Uh, Tanya noticed it, and then um, work noticed it. I couldn't control myself. You know, so when another squadron were playing enemy, um, or another regiment were playing enemy, fuck, I was cable tying them, I was just fucking treating them like you would an insurgent, you know, um, with dignity, but you would treat them. And I could, you know, I got called into the MO's office. And um, they said, we're going to send you off to uh, Older Shop, to the mental health place there for more assessment. Sent me off, came back. And then a couple, couple of weeks later, I got called in. They said, you're done. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you're done. He said, we've got the report back. You've got CPTSD, um, a few issues and stuff like that. And said, what we can do now is go on guard and leave. So um, leave now, go home. And um, we're... We will um, get hold of you in a moment of time, which they did. It took me a year to get it. And are you coming up with a plan B then in your mind? Well, in fact, we were living in secure housing at the time because we got death threats um, yeah. from the shot that I'd done because it all got leaked to the media. Uh, my name, my wife's name, my daughter's name, you know, um, my dog's name, where I lived, everything. So we got death threats off the Taliban, um, or not the Taliban, but like Al Qaeda, they wanted to cut my head off. No, um, for a retaliation for what I, the, the stuff that I'd done in Africa. So we got put in hiding, we were in hiding for three years. I had to check my car with a mirror all the time. What, three years? Yeah, and then they found out that there was a, 
a car in Birmingham lined out with plastic and he found it and the, the police found it and for the information that he got I had my picture in the car ready to come and get me. What was the one thing that you think you needed to screw it, just do it and get you from where you were to where you wanted to be, to where you are now? My wife. Turned in. Yeah, she's directed me. Mm-hmm. Encouraged me to write the book. Encouraged me to do the school. Craig, it's been an amazing conversation. I have, to, I have some really interesting ones this week, like I said, from Chris Bellum Smith to AFC Bournemouth. Goal Keeper, this would be my favourite one. So, <laughs> yeah, it's just raw and it's real, and you, you can, you know, not everything I can relate to. Of course, I can't because I haven't been through what you've been through, but lived different lives. But um, I just know that this is going to help so many people, and I know the impact you gain on like my friend Dodge's podcast and that's where I, you came into my view and I was just like right I need to get you on and I yeah. you know again you, you do get back to people but I know clearly busy, you know, busy in a good way yeah, yeah, and sure. if we can get you doing you know what you love permanently then yeah let's do it man yeah appreciate that awesome thanks a lot no thanks for having me